Is everyone ready? Um, who here has been to Chicago? It's not surprising. It is the third largest city in the United States, the biggest city in the Midwest region. You know, to say the Midwest region is a little inexact, but I think we all have a, an idea. So um, I'm looking at 20 years span. And uh, it's basically an odyssey in learning how to do remote sensing with Chicago as my subject. I'll be covering all these points here. Um, and when we finally get to my outcomes and next steps and comments and questions, we can discuss where this research might, might be going. So here are my research questions. Um, I decided to focus on Chicago's urban forest because they kind of make a big deal about it in their planning documents. Um, I wondered if the forest is increasing, but also is the total urban area increasing? And then um, where the conversion is coming from. So I touched on this a little bit, but I think the one crucial aspect of sustainability which Chicago is aiming towards is urban forest coverage. So that's why I chose that. Here is my imagery. The slide on the left uh, was taken with Landsat 5. That's surface reflectance data from NASA. The one on the right is Landsat 8 OLI. Um, it's, a, it's a standard kind of remote sensing overlay. These, um, these images were produced with Envy, so the purple is the urban area. So my regions of interest, which I produced uh, using Google Earth and um, tracing out polygons, were white roofs uh, because they have high albedo. So they're going to help with the urban heat island effect, reducing it is the hope. Uh, water, because you have ponds and lakes throughout Chicago, also the Chicago River, and then, of course, Lake Michigan skyscrapers, which for which Chicago is well known. Uh, this sort of group's class next is trees and houses, um, because I noticed that there were some areas of the city that really presented, um, when, I, when I gathered these images at the time of year, quite a full canopy. It was very difficult to actually see buildings through them or even the streets. So, that led me to, to kind of make this assumption that that ought to be its own region of interest. Then I saw also a lot of grass, mainly around the airport, uh, parks. Um, this residential class would then be those places in the city where I didn't see quite the extent of tree coverage. Um, then forest on the outskirts, just, you know, raw forest. Um, then trees and grass was kind of another combination class um, in the sense that I saw, you know, um, parks and golf courses and cemeteries, which presented this kind of, kind of picturesque sort of mown grass few trees here or there kind of thing, and I, I thought it would be nice to try and pick that up as well. And then finally, asphalt. Um, this was, uh, for better or for worse, um, uh, gathered up from rooftops, which I just, I thought, you know, it's a black roof, so it's asphalt, and also the parking lots. 
Um, of course, when you're doing regions of interest with Landsat imagery, you have to be aware of the spatial resolution and you're going to want to capture 90 square meters, not just 30. Um, so it was, it was difficult to find those enough parking lots um, that weren't actually kind of peppered with cars, but I managed to do it. Um, I, just, I wasn't quite able to get above a million square meters, but uh, as you can see from the number of polygons there, I put quite a bit of effort into trying to find those patches of asphalt. Uh, moving on. I think that, I mean, I, I wanted to do the beaches and the green roofs of Chicago. Um, I just couldn't quite get there with my ROI. Um, concrete and gravel would be another thing to, to look into, perhaps. But the, the places where I could find them, I wasn't necessarily sure if it was concrete or I was, but it was a very linear strip. Just couldn't justify that. Um, cars, there are quite a few parking lots in these images with just jammed with cars. So I thought, try and find some cars. Uh, but, you know, you again, coming back to that spatial resolution, you really need to be aware of that. And finding 90 square meters of cars, it's not that difficult. But expecting the computer, which I'll get into in a little bit, to pick out a car from that is not a great expectation to have. Um, and I put this last note uh, because finer resolution data is available. I'm just not going to use it at the moment because I don't have free access to it, like the lovely USGS NASA program, which I hope will be ongoing for pretty much the rest of time. It's just a great program. Okay, so I decided to choose uh, the maximum likelihood classification system and just get to, to my little notes. The reason why is because it is sensitive to both variance and covariance. In the training data, it is more accurate than the parallel pi pad and the minimum distance to means methods. Um, but it is slower in terms of uh, computationally intensive operation. And of course, the training data needs to be normally distributed. So I worked very hard to make my training end members as um, rigorous as I possibly could. Google Earth really helped with that. Um, the imagery was uh, in many respects of a finer resolution than the Landsat. So that's something to also be aware of. Now, here is a ISO data classification that I did. Uh, because when I performed my supervised classification, I ran into some difficulties, which we'll see on the next slide. And I thought, why not just let the computer handle it and see how it does? And it really did well. Um, we can't really zoom in, but we can see um, in, the, uh, in the left image, 1996, um, in the lower left corner, you can see kind of a, a greenish blob, <laughs> technical term. Um, and on the right image, it's actually red. Um, so the 1996 data was a little bit uh, harder for the computer to, and this was done in Envy. So we're talking, that's what we're talking about. Um, so in 2016, Envy picked up the water uh, of the lake and all throughout the city quite well and just couldn't quite get to some of the water uh, in the 1996 data. Now here's my classification supervised. You can see my classes. The pink is, un the bright pink is unclassified. There was some pretty good response from the lake, but as you can see, 
there's a lot of unclassified pixels in both time periods. And the ISO data uh, unsupervised didn't have a problem with that, but the supervised uh, classification did. And so that was a little bit of a worry. It made me think maybe I, I hadn't done so well with gathering up my end members as I had thought. Uh, another difficulty which um, I found out later just um, kind of searching around thinking, what, you know, why did this happen? Why am I getting so much noise? It turns out that this image was taken two days after a supercell thunderstorm flooded Chicago. So in my mind, that's kind of how the lake becomes unclassified because there's parts of the city that are flooded, but they're also asphalt, any sort of uh, land cover underneath that water. And the, the sensor is obviously just picking up what it, you know, the surface reflectance, and I think that that may have had something to do with it. Um, another thing that, uh, that happened was, as I, as I saw this and, and really was trying to work with it, I thought maybe I should do a reclass, and I, I eventually did go from uh, 12 down to five classes. So the outcomes, um, for the unclassified pixels are, uh, there's a total of 1,605,000 roughly, and 486,000 of those were unclassified in 1996. Uh, 234,000, give or take, 14.6% were unclassified in 2016. Um, I think that the 1996 scenes classification is slightly more robust than it appears, my, my supervised, because the entire limb of the lake was unclassified. And there were some weaknesses in the 2016 classification um, because the lake water was also misclassified. So, what we can see here is that the most change from T1 to T2, 1996 to 2016, occurred from unclassified to water. We just went over that. Um, and then kind of coming up later would, uh, or as a tie, would be unclassified to skyscrapers. And I think that had something to do with, um, there's this new thing called, uh, and sorry, I think I'm gonna get to that at the at just in a couple more slides. But um, if we take these figures at face value, uh, it would seem, from a sustainability standpoint, to shift from white roofs to asphalt, and, and then we can see that happening don't know exactly why, and again, this is a 20-year time span, but from an urban heat island effect, that would be not good. Um, also, from these figures, we can see that the end members that I selected were quite noisy. Now, this would be a very low percentage changes from 1996 to 2016. Um, I've highlighted forest to water because you don't really expect to see that. Uh, but again, Chicago is a very dynamic city, so it's possible that um, new water features are made, uh, perhaps as part of civil engineering projects to try and drain large, vast areas of, of water. And um, of course, there was the flooding, so those areas would have been inundated. Would, they would have been grass if they hadn't been flooded, but instead they were perhaps water. But still quite a small percent, and um, uh, I just, 
I thought forced to water, you know, it's, that's really, it's really something. And that's what led me to all my questions and ultimately led me to the supercell storm and all that good stuff. So for my next steps, I really want to look at um, determining the accuracy of the 1996 classification uh, by counting the lake pixels in the scene and also performing the point and polygon based accuracy assessments for both scenes. I would like to digitize Chicago zoning maps, uh, 1996's and today's, and then assess the correlation, if any, between the changes in zoning and the changes in land use and land cover change. And then I'd like to try and use these classifications as part of an agent-based model and try to predict future land use and land cover change. So that kind of ends my journey of using America's third largest city to learn more about remote sensing and ultimately come to this idea that um, using Google Earth uh, to create your end members when the resolution is so fine and then trying to switch back to Landsat 8 and Landsat 5 data seems to have created a bit of a dissonance. So I'll just open it up to comments and questions. When you did that uh, creation of your training data set using Google Earth, did you, were you able to, to find uh, appropriate imagery that was concurrent with your 1996 scene to create independent training data sets, or did you create one training data set fully and then apply that to both the 1996 data and the 2016 data? It was the latter. There is um, Google data out there from as far back as 1950. You see it's very coarse and black and white. Um, but I, when it comes, and that's with, you know, certain Street View products. But when it comes to looking at the entire area of Chicago, they don't really allow that. And another difficulty, which I'm glad you bring up, is that depending on what your uh, map aspect is, you could be looking at different imagery. So as you zoom in, you might be looking at more recent imagery, and as you zoom out, you might be looking at uh, later or, or, or pa more past imagery. I suspect that may be part of your issue with some of the misclassification of the pixels, because if you're using your training data set, that if that training data area was previously in some other Thank you for that. Any other comments or questions? Um, first off, interesting, interesting piece of work. I'm glad you talked about the scale issue because certainly Chicago is a very diverse place and you can imagine a lot of different things happening in, in Texas. Um, yeah, back to, the, back to the classes you just saw, a little bit of change in the show. Um, maybe to kind of follow up on that. Um, you know, obviously some change is due to real change, right? Something that could happen in another part is surely misclassification. Right. And it could be at least numbers like that that could just represent the noise in your in your kind of classification scheme. And it might give you a little more confidence on some of the numbers that you're seeing that where you see the large changes where you say, well, they're really you know, orders of magnitude larger than what you're seeing now. Okay. Do you think that it would be worthwhile I'm openness to anyone in the room? Um, to try and get some uh, Landsat imagery during the fall when the leaves are on, as well as during the spring when the leaves are in summer when the leaves are on. Because I'm obviously I'm looking at urban forestry cover, but if you're going to do that type of thing, the best bet to do that would be to do a multi-seasonal stack of imagery. So you're maybe getting a range, but if you have a spring image. Seven bands or one, you know, Landsat bands, you could have 14 bands 
Mm -hmm. I think that would give you a little bit of freedom or be more stuck with characteristics. The thing you have to be careful with them is that there can be change between spring and the fall, right? And so you have to kind of be very rigorous to, to make sure that there's not a lot of dynamic change happening within the course of the year when the ship is sitting on the net. Um, but I would, I would definitely not do any classification comparison where your seasons are different. OK. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Talking about urban forests, <coughs> those, those residential forests or the forested grasslands, are those forests or are those not forests? I think we have to, considering we're within the jurisdiction of a city and a very urbanized one, you kind of, uh, and uh, I'm coming at this not just from a geography standpoint, from an urban planning standpoint. And I would say it's forest. It's definitely urban forest, though. I mean, I, I've taken care to, I try to find end members from what I thought were the urban forests uh, with the houses underneath versus just the straight forest with, um, you know, walking paths and um, kind of protected park areas that, that surround Chicago mainly to the Northwest. But um, I, I would only, I would justify that by the, the thermal effects you get because you have that canopy, so it's going to cool the area underneath. You do have habitat from those trees for insects and birds and little mammals, basically. And uh, for a city to have uh, that kind of a habitat, um, is uh, is an intangible of intangible value, but I think people would would just if you took a survey, it would be like yes, it's valuable. We just don't know exactly what the dollar amount is. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think okay. Oh, oh great. With your you made the decision. I have to say the reason I stuck with Landsat is because this was done during the course of a semester in a class and that was what we were working with. But we did cover Sentinel a little bit and I, I thought I would maybe try that later. I've actually never heard of Nate. What does that stand for? Uh, it's the National Agricultural Research Center. Yeah, it's the National Okay, I was, okay, I was spelling the acronym wrong. All right. That would work. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. That's that's good stuff. Um. Yes. They do, and it is, it's uh, kind of an open data portal that they operate. Um, I was able to get in contact with a librarian at the University of Chicago who thought that they might have the old zoning maps. Um, but just, uh, this is a great point, and it's something that could really take this research to the next level. Also, NDVI, or EVI would, would be good approaches as well. Um, but my time constraints were such that I couldn't quite <laughs> get there. But I think um, you know, the city of Chicago has a, a very long history in urban planning 
and if anyone's saving them, it's them. You know, so I, I think that that's a great uh, way forward. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks, man. Okay, thank you, everyone, for your attention.